I didn't set out to make a new congregation. We came to Houston with every intention of making our life here as we had planned it. I would be the rabbi of one of the largest congregations in the city. Abraham would continue wheelchair basketball with the local junior team. He and Sammy would finish growing up here in the new home that Natalie and I would build for us. But due to circumstances both in and out of my control, it didn't work out. There are some who say that not even Moses could have succeeded in my situation, and there are others who say it was all my fault. <laughs> it took five years of therapy to sort through it all. But this I do know. With every passing year since the great implosion of my professional life, I feel more certain that the universe conspired to bring me to you. Yes to you. This, this modest but remarkable, small but mighty, humble but glorious entity we call Congregation Shema Kolenu. Here we are, 10 years past an ending that became the beginning of an experiment that has become something unique and lasting and immensely valuable. I don't know if we are necessarily the most innovative in how we practice the Jewish faith, but I know we are innovative when it comes to the business of Judaism. We don't ask for dues. We do not maintain a building, but we provide all the things you need for Jewish life. Worship services, childhood education, life cycle events, High Holy Days, other holidays, lots of other holidays. I do a lot of counseling, both pastoral and around issues that arise for interfaith couples and families. For people facing but not ready for retirement. For people who are lonely and seeking greater purpose and connection. And we do this in a way that is totally unique in the Jewish community. We do it with 100% voluntary contributions. Simply join us and you already belong. CSK seeks to serve all Jewish people, Jewish families and those who love them, and all people and families searching for a Jewish spiritual connection. In all the best ways, CSK is a lot like the state of Texas, where there's an old saying which surely re resonates with most everyone in our community. I wasn't born here, but I got here as quickly as I could. My hope and my prayer is that we continue to earn your allegiance. And without a building to maintain, we must, interestingly, work especially hard to prove our worth. This is one of the essential elements of our success. It's not about a building. It's about you and us and our connection to each other and to the divine. And we must be accountable to each other in order to maintain this congregation. In part, because the mortar between the bricks isn't physical, it's relational. Maybe this is not so different from what we are asked of during the High Holy Days. We arrive here, each of us, with our chashbon hanefesh, our soul's accounting, our celestial balance sheet that records and recounts our credits and our deficits. My greatest hope is that this accounting will yield a net positive result for me, for you, for this congregation. Confirmation that our existence in this world over the past year 
has been more affirming and less depleting, more productive and less destructive, more substance and less bling. This is why on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur mornings, we recite together the Unatana Tokev prayer. Who shall live and who shall die? Who will reach the ripeness of age and who will be taken for the, for, before their time? Who will rest and who will wander? Who will be tranquil and who will be troubled? And with these words, we identify all these different ways in which we are not in control of our lives. Especially those days, those ways in which, God forbid, people's lives can come to an end abruptly. Perhaps due to an accident or crisis, an unexpected illness, or a myriad of circumstances in which life, as we know and expect it to be, changes in an instant. Our CSK community has had its share. We all have had our share. As we come together to recite the final verse of the Unatana Tokef prayer, we identify three ways by which we can ma'avirin et roa hagzera, temper the judgment of the severe decree by how we engage in teshuva, repentance, tefillah, prayer, and tzedakah, charity. Now, what it means to temper the judgment <clears throat> of the severe decree needs some unpacking. Does it mean that how we seek repentance and how we pray and how we give tzedakah can actually change our fate? Yes and no. Does it change our ultimate fate? I don't know. But can it change our lives? Can it make a real impact on the value and meaning of our lives? Without a doubt. Let's talk about teshuva for a second. If we could fundamentally fix a broken relationship on both sides, the side of the one who inflicted the wound and on the side of the one who was inflicted, think about how powerful that would be. Imagine that your family has a couple of adults who for whatever reason don't talk to each other. Or even worse, they do talk to each other. <laughs> but mostly with pettiness and rebuke. And it makes every family occasion one in which everyone has to decide that they are one, going to suffer the difficulty of being with these two individuals. Two, choose to ban one or another. Or three, to decide to go only to one place or another. Imagine if these two people somehow could figure out how to make teshuva with each other, whether it's for their own sake or for the rest of the family. It could change the lives of everyone else in the family. That is the power of teshuva. It ain't just about the individual's with the issues. What about tefillah? Prayer. How could that possibly temper the severe decree? We're not faith healers. And we don't believe in the idea that God rewards those who pray perfectly and punishes those who don't pray at all. How does tefillah lessen the severity of the decree of fate? Well, what if we could figure out how to pray in ways that keep us honest with ourselves and help us alleviate the degradations of the suffering of shame, overcoming or at least dumbing down the messages in our own minds that tell us we're not good enough? What if instead we allowed ourselves to be judged by the ideals of our liturgy, strivings for humility, kindness, sensitivity, openness, how transformational that could be. And what if we could learn to be more humble and kind and sensitive and open? What a gift that would be, not only to us, 
but to our loved ones. It could change how we lead and how we imagine and how we envision. It actually could change us so that, so that we actually lead and imagine and envision. And what about tzedakah? Tzedakah is defined by Jewish tradition as giving money or goods that can substantially impact or maybe even change someone else's life for the better. Tzedakah, the third component of the Unatana Tokef's prescription for tempering the decree, warrants as much unpacking as the first two. What if we could do a better job as individuals and as a society figuring out how much stuff is enough and how much is more than enough? As a college buddy of mine loved to quip, he who dies with the most toys is still dead. <laughs> what if we understood that financial success is not nearly as important as ensuring that we are stewards of the resources with which we have been blessed? And what if we believed wholeheartedly that all human beings are worthy of existing above a subsistence standard of living? And what if we believed all human beings were worthy of having enough to dream and create and not just exist? How amazing our world would be! This is the power of this vision. So tzedakah is different from charity. Charity, from the Latin word caritas, denotes an emotional element. The meaning of this word suggests that giving charity is meant to make us feel good. And of course, there is nothing wrong with that. However, the Hebrew word tzedakah stems from the Hebrew root tzedek, which means justice. The concept of tzedakah developed from the Torah's earliest depictions of ownership. The Israelite farmers are commanded to refrain from harvesting the corners of their fields, to leave the fallen sheaves of grain plants on the ground if they fall to harvest the vines only once, leaving behind the grapes that weren't picked on the first go-round. Moreover, these corners and sheaves of grain and grapes, the Torah teaches, don't actually belong to the farmers themselves. God tells us the, the harvest doesn't belong exclusively to them, to us. According to the Torah, the farmers, and we for that matter, are only stewards of these resources, not the absolute owners. To give tzedakah is to share your harvest with others who, for whatever reason, are unable themselves to plant, sow, and harvest their own. And tzedakah is the act of pooling your harvests with others to make possible things that otherwise would not be. I want to repeat that. Tzedakah is the act of pooling your harvests with others to make possible things that otherwise would not be. Making the unlikely possible, creating life from dead ends, reincarnating fertile ground from scorched earth. On an average day, these might sound like the stuff of miracles. But today is no average day. Today is Yom Kippur. Today, the gates are flung wide open and we are beseeched to enter. God is begging us. The angels are beckoning us Heaven and earth are standing at attention, inviting us to reinvigorate our lives despite the mortally challenging fact that we are so very much not in control of so very much. But how we rebuild broken relationships and how we can at any one moment go inside and rediscover our own 
holiness, wholeness, and potential. And the way the generous allocation of our own resources can free us from the belief that we are not what we own. How we exercise these three powerful efforts that do ma'avirin et roa hagzeira, teshuva, tefila, and sedaka, temper the judgment of the severe decree that one day we will die. And that this is, our really, is really our only shot at life. All these things can exorcise the debilitating effects of recrimination, regret, and selfishness. All responses that cause us to hold on ever tighter to a world that is inevitably as slippery as sand through our fingers. Indeed, we can temper the judgment of the severest of decrees with teshuva, tefillah, and tzedakah. The shofar calls to us from a thousand generations to wake up, to realize that our lives are too short not to be humble, not to forgive, not to give ourselves a break. Our lives are too short to hold so tightly to physical resources that it fools us into believing that the truly unlimited resource of love is a commodity itself. It isn't. If it were a commodity, if love were a commodity, it would be the best and worst investment you could ever make. The best because it's ever reproducing. But the worst because at some point, people finally, God willing, awaken to the reality that love isn't something we have to go over the mountain or across the sea or to Walmart to get. It's right here in our mouths and in our hearts. As Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, the first chief rabbi of Israel, taught, the entire rationale for Judaism is the recognition that love flows constantly through the world to and for each other. And the sole task, this is Rabbi Cook, the first chief rabbi of Israel. The sole task of Jewish life, ritual, and tradition, according to Rav Cook, is to unclog the places where our love is getting caught up. I call this spiritual plavix. Plavix, it's a cholesterol drug. Just all right. Our task all the time is to get the love moving again, flowing, accessible, abundant. Imagine for a moment that this was your kavanah, that this was your intention with every mitzvah you performed. It's the reason and the rationale and the purpose of it all. The shofar is calling. We are not simply here to reproduce the past. We are here to live, to grow, to nurture, and share, and love, and embrace. This is what God and the angels and heaven and earth call upon us today to remember. The Houston Jewish community didn't and doesn't need another mainstream reform synagogue. But it does need a place that practices radical acceptance a courageous embrace of the future, and one that can serve as a catalyst for systemic change that challenges norms. Over the course of 10 years, we have changed our organizations, organization ourselves and this beloved community. We have lost some and gained many others. We are an institution of note in this community, and despite the fact that I could never have imagined what would happen here, when good people with dreamy ambitions would seek to build a new kind of Jewish community, we do indeed ma'avirin at roahag zerah every single day. We make our time here matter. I often share mine and CSK's pride that we have so far celebrated 
67 B'nai Mitzvah in 27 different locations. And by the end of the school year, 77. But that's just a numbers game. I don't really care if it's 67 or 77 or 87. All I care about is one. And CSK makes it possible for me and for us to be present to one and then another one and then another one, one at a time. Because each of them is the embodiment not just of the miracle of Jewish survival, but truly the embodiment of the blood, sweat, and tears that form the holy space that is CSK. We are a standard bearer of change that puts the souls and soul of each person at the center of our efforts. And this is how we love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, and our might. May each of us hear the call of the shofar echoing upon our eardrums. Tekiah. Let us awaken to the teshuva that we must seek and we can offer. Shevarim. Let us awaken to the feelings of brokenness within us that only we know and only we can mend. Teruah. Let us awaken to the many and multivalent ways in which we can bring healing to the world with the resources and gifts with which we have been blessed. Tekiah Gadola, let us awaken and get on with 5784. With whom do you need to repair a broken friendship? What are the tropes that you regularly say to yourself that you know are not helpful or even true? And what are the causes and institutions you believe in and maybe even benefit from that deserve more of your guilt? It's already the 10th day of the year 5784. It's time to start.